So, uh, morning everyone, thank you for coming in. Uh, I am standing in for Gautam Reggae today. I will substitute his good humor with, uh, I'm not sure what, but I will try to keep you as entertained as he did. So, uh, let us, uh, let me start by introducing our keynote speaker for today, Mark Bates. Um, I was just catching up with him to find out a little about him, and uh, he was telling me that he, uh, he is a genuine rock star programmer, in the sense that he is a rock star and a programmer. He's got a music degree, 25 years of, uh, of, of playing music, and Paul McCartney bought him a beer, right? So <laughs> I if you guys buy him a beer, you're in a uh, very elevated company. So uh, Mark is, uh, is the founder and chief architect of Meta42 Labs and is a published author, books on Ruby, CoffeeScript, Command Line 2, right? So, uh, well, over to you. Thank you for being here. I hope you have a good time. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Okay, good morning. Oh, that was okay, that was better than yesterday. Um, I hope you guys are doing better than I am today. So I got introduced to Indian whiskey yesterday, which I didn't even think was a thing. Um, and, you know, it was described to me as rough, which I think is the word you use for the next morning. <laughs> I, I don't know, I, I'm pretty sure you could strip wallpaper with it. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was interesting. Um, so first, I just want to say, obviously, thank you for, for coming here. Thank you for letting me come here. It's my first time in India. It's pretty cool. Um, before I start, I wasn't originally supposed to give the opening keynote today. For those of you who don't know, I'm not Bill Kennedy. Um, I don't have a cool hat, um, you know, but he couldn't make it, unfortunately. His grandfather had passed away, so obviously my condolences to Bill. Um, so the organizers asked me very last minute to step in. So I turned a 20-minute talk into a 40-minute talk. Um, so the, there's a lot of filibustering, as Corey Lanou would tell you. <laughs> it's, just a, it's just a lot of sight gags and uh, bad puns. So, so bear with me for the next 40 minutes. Uh, we're going to talk about fighting FUD. For those of you who don't know what FUD is, FUD is an anachronism that means fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And I, I started doing some research on this topic uh, recently, <clears throat> yesterday, and uh, I found out that the term FUD came out about 100 years ago in relationship to marketing. Um, it's, it's been used for longer than that, uh, but the term itself actually came up about 100 years ago. Uh, and we see this constantly in marketing. Um, one of the biggest purveyors is, say, cell phone companies. I'm sure you've seen this before, you know, cell phone company A says, well, if you use cell phone company B, you won't have any coverage, and then when your house catches on fire, you can't call the fire department, your family's going to die in a horrible, tragic fire because you didn't get our unlimited plan. Um, you know, so we hear that sort of FUD all the time. The other place we hear FUD um, is in politics. It's an election year in America, which is why I'm not there currently. Um, we're like, <laughs> it's, trust me, it's a terrible place to be during an election year. Um, but politics is nothing but FUD at this point. There is no actual real dialogue or discourse in politics. It is pure FUD, and I'm sure, um, is it the same way here in India? Yeah, of course it is. It's politics, right? I'm pretty sure that's what the word politics means. You look up politics, like, see FUD. Um, the other place that we see FUD as a development community uh, is online. Uh, we see it in places like Hacker News, which I believe the latest statistic has it at 99% FUD, um, particularly if you read the comments section. Um, <laughs> what a, just what a terrible, terrible site. Um, you know, Reddit, right? Reddit's also full of FUD. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about FUD, and we're going to talk, uh, I'm going to split this talk into kind of two halves. The first half, we're going to understand what FUD is, where it kind of comes from within a person, and then we're going to talk about five very specific things to go uh, that we hear a lot as Go developers about FUD, and we're going to talk about ways that we can kind of turn the conversation around on that, those pieces of FUD. So, before I do that, I want to talk about two different types of people you're going to encounter when you're having a conversation about FUD. We're going to call these people Elmers. Um, I would, I'm absolutely 100% convinced this joke was not going to play here, um, <laughs> but I'm going with it anyway. For those of you who don't know, that is Elmer Fudd. He was a very popular, or was a very popular cartoon character when I was a kid. Um, but we're going to talk, uh, talk about people who spout FUD. We're going to call them Elmers. 
uh, for the sake of this talk because there's no other good, what do you call them, fudders? That just sounds weird. Uh, mother fudders <laughs> was another term I thought of. <laughs> but I was convinced that if I spent the entire talk calling people mother fudders, that uh, things were just going to go bad at one point. <laughs> and I'm sure I'd violate some sort of code of conduct somewhere. So we're going to call them Elmers. Um, <laughs> and there's two types of Elmers in the world. And it's very important that when you enter into a conversation and the person starts spouting off FUD, you very quickly identify which type of Elmer you're talking to. The first type are what I call the haters. <laughs> oh, good. So this joke did play. <laughs> right? That's just an awesome picture, by the way. That's his, that's like his, that's his driver's license photo, for those of you who didn't know. Um, haters, uh, haters, just nothing you can say to a hater will convince them otherwise. No amount of science, facts, logic, demonstrable proof. You know, I could look at Donald Trump and say, your tie's blue. He's like, screw you, it's red. Um, it's like, okay, fine, your tie's red. So when you, when you get in a conversation with a hater, like, just move on. Just move on. It is not worth having this conversation. You're just going to want to punch somebody, most likely yourself, in the face. Um, so move on. The other type of Elmer uh, is the type... <laughs> I know, right? Uh, it's the type who kind of regurgitates stuff they've read on Reddit or Hacker News. And you know these people, they'll self-identify as this type of Elmer, because they'll say, oh, well, I heard that Go is X, Y, and Z, or I read that whatever. Um, you know. So this is the type of person we're going to talk about. We're going to you know, screw the haters. We're going to talk about the guys with the birds in their heads. Um, I don't even have a name for them, but I just love that picture. So we're going to talk about them. What was that? Somebody have a name for them? No? Okay. Um, so we're going to talk about them. These are the people that we can talk to, and because they're just uneducated, and we can turn them around. So let's dive in. We're going to get into some real serious, you know, kind of understanding of what FUD here is in the first, first section of this talk. So all the good geeks in the room should get this quote, right? If you don't, if you don't get this quote, or you don't know who Yoda is, there's a door right there, <laughs> and just... Feel free, because the rest of the talk is going to go right over your head. <laughs> um, fear is a very, well, it's, I was going to say a very scary thing, but that's just a stupid thing to say. Um, <laughs> fear is an interesting thing, and it plays very deeply on all of us. And I personally believe there are two types of fears. Um, I am not a scientist. I do have a degree in music, so everything I say, take with not just like a grain of salt, but like a salt lick, maybe the Dead Sea. Um, I think there's two types of fears that people have. One is what I call a primal fear. Right? These fears come from the chest. You can't rationalize them, you can't explain them. These are things like fears of snakes, heights, planes, public speaking. Um, you know, so interesting fact, uh, the public speaking is the ranked per people's most number one fear, with the fear of death as number two, which means people would rather die than speak in public. <laughs> <laughs> Which just makes no sense to me. Um, but primal fears, they, they are, they, we can't rationalize them. Uh, I am, and I'm not afraid of this, I'm afraid of dogs. I am deathly afraid of dogs. I'm afraid of that dog. I'm afraid of your dog. I'm afraid of all dogs. And everybody tells me, oh, my dog's the best. My dog's so great. No, it's not. Your dog is a scary, vicious, killing machine in my eyes. Uh, when I see your dog, I think Cujo. Uh, Cujo is, for those of you who don't know, a Stephen King novel, later a movie, great movie, uh, about a dog that goes rabid and tries to kill his family and traps him in a car and like, throws his body against the car. It's insane. But that's what I see when I see this little dog. I see Cujo. I see a vicious killing machine. I can't rationalize it. I've never been bitten by a dog, never been attacked by a dog. We had a dog as a kid. Very nice dog. My niece is named after the dog. Don't ask. <laughs> I know, it's really weird to have a niece named Spot, but we love her. <laughs> she's, a, she's a beautiful girl. <laughs> I actually do have a niece named after a dog, that is true. Um, but anyway, so that's what I see, and I can't explain it. The other type of fear are what, are called, what I call intellectual fears. These are the ones that come from up here. Uh, these are the ones that people say they have no rationalization for, but really they do. Uh, these are the types of fears that we can talk to. These are the type of fears that we can have conversations around. These are type of fears that drive FUD. So for example, I have a very good friend of mine who has been programming in a language we'll call Java for the past 20 years. 
Uh, and he loves Java. And he's a very, very, very smart guy. Some would argue he's been doing Java for 20 years, so how smart could he be? But trust me, he's a very <laughs> smart guy. <laughs> I love him. He's a very, very dear friend of mine. And we'll have these conversations, and I'll say, you know, hey, man, you know, job is cool, but what about, you know, I don't know, we'll call it uh, Bubby or Mo or Lython. I don't know. There's a whole bunch of other languages out there. And he'll say things like, well, I already know Java, um, and, you know, I don't, have, I don't have the time to learn something new. And he'll come up with all these rationalizations why he won't use Java. And so recently, uh, why he only uses Java. So recently I sat down, I had a cup of coffee with him, uh, and I asked him, I said, let's get to the truth of this. Like, why do you really use Java? I said, do you have to use it because of some business reason? Do you work for Oracle, or uh, Boracle, we'll call it Boracle. Um, do you work for Boracle, is that why you use Java? And he's like, no, no, I don't, I don't work for Boracle, although my brother does, and I do call it Boracle. Um, and, uh, you know, I said, well, what is it? What's the truth? And he finally kind of opened up to me and he said, well, I, I use Java because I'm afraid that if I learn something new, I won't be the master programmer that I am. People come to me and they know I know the answer. I know that language spec inside and out. I know every library. I know, you know, everything about Java. If I go and learn Go or if I go and learn Ruby, I'm not going to be that person anymore. I'm not going to be like that, you know, that amazing developer because I'm gonna start from scratch again. And so he's very afraid of that concept. Uncertainty, this is a, an interesting one, right? There's nothing sure in life, right? We've all heard the saying, except death and taxes. I know, it may be aliens. Um, I know I'm gonna die. I know I have to pay my taxes. Those are the two things I'm the most, I'm 100% certain about. Everything else, I can take a good guesstimate that I'm pretty certain about, but I don't know for certain. Um, and I'll get this kind of go fud a lot from people, um, and they'll say things like, how will I know it'll still be around in five years, right? You know, Google's a major company, which was a shock to me. I thought they were a startup out of Mountain View. I had no idea. Um, but I Googled it, and apparently they're pretty big. They're pretty big. Good for you. Good for you. Um, <laughs> it's always nice to see a success story come out of Silicon Valley. Anyway. <laughs> So, you know, you know, it'll say, well, how do I know it's going to be around in five years? What if Google pulls the plug tomorrow? So I'll say, okay, well, Mr. Java developer, what if Oracle pulls the plug tomorrow? What are you going to do? Is your code going to stop working? Well, well, no. Can you still write new code? Well, well, yeah. Can your app still run? Uh-huh. So what's the difference? What if Facebook pulled React tomorrow? They said, we're not doing any more development on React. Not a big deal because there's a new framework in three months down the line. It's coming out anyway, so <laughs> it's not a big deal with React. But the, the concept kind of exists, right? People are, you know, they get scared by that level of uncertainty. You know, they don't know, like, well, you know, job has been around for 20 years. So that same logic, I'm like, well, why aren't you doing COBOL? <laughs> you know, I mean, Grace Murray Hoppe was not a spring chicken when she wrote that. And <laughs> it's been around for a long, long time. Like, why aren't you still doing COBOL? It's still around. Doubt. So I thought a long and hard about how I was going to talk about doubt. And I realized that <laughs> doubt, I mean, it's basically, these things are all basically types of fear. And doubt's an interesting one. Because really, to me, whenever someone says, well, I doubt that it'll solve my problem. I doubt that it's as performant as you say. I doubt that, you know, X, Y, and Z. There's only one real answer to that that I always give, which is, how do you know until you try it? You don't know, right? Let's sit down and let's code up some Go. Give me a simple little problem, one of your you know, problems that you do day to day. Let's sit down, we'll code it up, and we'll see. We'll see just how fast it is. We'll see if it solves your problem. We'll see if it does what it says in the tin for you. People are afraid. You're afraid of the unknown. You're afraid of change. You're afraid of failure. You're afraid of themselves. They're afraid of seeing all these things in themselves. Have I got you sufficiently bummed out for Saturday morning? It's Saturday, right? Saturday morning? Yeah. This is what you want to hear Saturday morning, right? Afraid of failure. Fear of failure. Good night, everybody. <laughs> so let's move on. Let's actually talk about fighting some actual Go FUD. Except we're going to take about five different parts of Go. 
and we're going to talk about them. We're going to rationalize them. We're going to reason them out and uh, see if we can come up with some good arguments for the FUD we hear from these Elmers. So the first bit ago I want to talk about, <laughs> I, I'm curious to see if anybody can figure out what it is I'm going to talk about from this slide. I want to talk about errors. <laughs> oh, come on, people. That's a huge error. <laughs> this was a huge error right here. <laughs> I was trying to figure out a good slide to, to capture the essence of errors, and I was like, is there any bigger error than the Phantom Menace? Uh, and the answer is no. There is, there is no bigger error. That one went to 11. Um, it was a pretty big error. So <laughs> when people talk about errors and go, what they're really talking about is this kind of highlighted section here. And now, you probably can't read that in the back, and that's okay. Uh, I sat in the back yesterday, I couldn't read a single bit of code. But what this is, you know, it's that simple like if error does not equal nil, do something pattern. People seem to really, really, really hate this pattern. Raise your hand if you've talked to somebody and they've said how much they hate this pattern. Yeah, oh, it's a lot. Like people really despise this pattern. But the pattern that people seem to love, and again, doesn't matter if you can't see this, this is some Java code. Um, you know, is this kind of try, catch, finally, begin, rescue, end, ensure kind of pattern? And they'll say to me things like, well, you know, when I type if, er, now, whatever, like, that's so much typing, and I have to do it all the time. I'm like, look at this! <laughs> like, this is not a lot of typing? I don't get it! And they're like, well, my IDE, which I have to use because the language spec is so insane, uh, will do that for me. And I'm like, okay, well, you know what? I can, I've got a little shortcut in Vim that I type er, tab, and it does this for me, too. So, uh, you know, we can, we can work around that. Um, but they like this pattern for some reason. They, they find comfort in catching errors. And they'll say, I like that pattern. I like being able to throw an error and catch an error. <laughs> and I'm, li I'm like, what are you, a baseball player? Like, <laughs> like how is this a fun pattern to you? This is insane. Um, I'm like, this is a terrible workflow. I'm like, when I, when I code Go, what's nice here is I can stop. I'm in my kind of flow of my workflow here. And I can say, OK, I had a problem. Right? How do I, yeah, I can solve my problem right there and continue on my workflow. Let's say I'm reading in some sort of configuration file. Configuration file doesn't exist. OK, fine. I catch the error. I load up a bunch of defaults. And I just continue on like doing what I was doing here, right? If you, I'm, again, don't bother trying to read this Java code. Um, you know, if I catch the file, if all the file doesn't exist, I end up in this catch or maybe this finally, depending on which catch is, which error is thrown, what have you. And then I'm like, okay, I want to set defaults. Now what do I do? Do I call this function again? Do I call a different function? Do I put try catches on every single line to capture each bit of the, of the error that I'm having? I don't have that problem in Go. Yeah, you know what? I see these, and sometimes it kind of bothers me. I'm like, oh, I've got like eight of those in this function. But then I think, you know what? I've got much better control over what I'm doing in that function than if I did this. And, and again, you know, th that's a lot of friggin' typing. <laughs> so don't give me the typing argument. People say that, I, can I just say before I even go on with this section, three hours of Photoshopping to put a gopher on his t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Three hours. <laughs> and he's got a little 70s afro, too, if you can't see it. That's really what took the most time. I'm available for all your Photoshopping needs, by the way. <laughs> Thank God. I couldn't Photoshop my way out of a wet paper bag. Three hours, that's no lie. Um, people say that Go is stuck in the 70s. Have we heard this one, right? You've probably heard this one. Go is stuck in the 70s. It's not a modern language, right? And what people really mean is, why isn't it Haskell? I really wish it could be Haskell. That's what I want. Haskell's this amazing language. And so what I say is, you know what? No one uses Haskell. Move on. <laughs> like, it's great. It's a great language, but move the on. Um, stop being a mother fudder. <laughs> you know, it is, you know, the, the, you know, I'm sure if you talk to Brad, he'll tell you that the reason why Go looks the way it does, I always say it kind of looks like a cross between C and JavaScript, that they kind of had some sort of a baby, is because, you know, part of it is it's a familiar syntax to people, right? Yeah, it's an older looking syntax, but they don't want to reinvent the wheel of syntaxes, right? When you're inventing, when you're creating a language, you want a language that is immediately accessible to people. 
you know, I sat down and go for the very first time. I was like, okay, this looks pretty familiar to me. Like, this isn't difficult. The syntax is not hard to me. So yeah, it might look like an older language, but at its core, it's fundamentally not. And we know this, right? We know that it's built with concurrency right from day one, right from day one. You know, we know it has this modern tooling, this amazing modern tooling. I mean, Brad talked about some of the amazing tools, which, by the way, Brad, Go imports should be the default, and we should just get rid of Go Fumped. Just make Go imports the default. Uh, who here doesn't use Go inputs? Go imports. Exactly. <laughs> Point proven. 100% of the Go community in India uses Go imports. Um, we know that it's maintainable, right? Go code is meant to be maintainable by large teams. And we know that it scales. And we know this because the company the behind it, if we all took, like, you know, excluding obviously the people from Google in the room, if we took all of our, you know, hits across the year, all of our traffic, and we added it all up together in the course of a year, we're probably not hitting what they hit in an hour. I'm not exaggerating. It, they do an insane amount of traffic. And they said, this is a language we're going to use to help with that problem. Like, shouldn't we step up and listen just a little bit? Like, you know, like that's, that's, like, that's a big vote of confidence to me. So it's not stuck in the 70s. Might look like it. Trust me, it's not. OK, so I come from the Ruby world. I originally did Java for a long time. I'm going to keep calling it that. I did Java for a long time, and then I rage quit development in like 2004. Um, that's a God's honest truth. I did Java for like five years, and I just rage quit. I flipped the table over one day, and I said to my wife, I'm done. I can't stand this anymore. And I went and I worked in a recording studio in Boston, um, to which I have many code of conduct violating stories I could tell you later at the bar, <laughs> but certainly not going to tell you on stage. And then I discovered Ruby in about 2005, um, and it kind of reinvigorated my life. And during that time, obviously, there's a little framework called Rails. Has anybody here ever heard of it? Yeah, it's a little framework, right? Um, and Rails at the time, I mean, it changed. It, it flipped web development on its head. And it was unlike anything anybody had seen before. And, you know, since every language has its own copy of Rails. So when I'm at Ruby conferences, it's funny, I was saying last night to a few people, when I'm at Go conferences, I talk about Ruby. When I'm at Ruby conferences, I talk about Go. I'm basically constantly trolling whatever audience I'm in front of. <laughs> because I do quite enjoy both languages, I'm not going to lie to you. And I think it's okay to enjoy more than one language, by the way. Um, but that's a whole other discussion we can get into. Um, but people ask me all the time, well, what's the uh, Rails equivalent in, uh, in Go? As a matter of fact, I asked the same question with Andrew Garand and uh, Blake Miserani. We were spending a weekend in Istanbul once, don't ask. <laughs> Again, another great story. And I asked him that question, and Blake like spit his coffee out of his mouth, and Andrew's eyes like rolled back into his head. Um, and it was about five minutes before either of them said anything to me. <laughs> but I get asked this question all the time, and there are a bunch of frameworks. And some of them have been mentioned here already, Bigo, Revel, Martini, Gin, et cetera. But you know what? None of them have taken off. None of them have grabbed hold of the Go community the way that Rails grabbed hold of Ruby, or the way Django grabbed hold of Python, or you, the list can go on, those are the only two I know, or Phoenix for Elixir, right? Um, none of them have grabbed hold because Ruby and Go are very different languages. When you bring one of these types of frameworks into your Go app, what you're really bringing is this. You're bringing a lot of unneeded complexity to your application. You're bringing things like reflection. Ask Rob Pike what he thinks about reflection sometime uh, and see what he says. Uh, but duck, duck when you ask him, like, <laughs> right? And when you do reflection, you're bringing, you're slowing down your app. I mean, you are killing the Go performance when you do the level of reflection that these frameworks are using. If you ask somebody like Jeremy Sands, Code Gangsta, um, who's about as gangster as a Twinkie, I love the guy, and we're a good friend, but he is as gangster as a Twinkie, man. Um, <laughs> he'll tell you, no, don't use Martini. He wrote Martini. He'll tell you, don't use it. It's terrible. Um, and you bring a level of kind of instability. Your Go apps go from being one or two millisecond response times to 100 millisecond response times, 200 millisecond. Now you're in the Ruby land when you start talking those response times. Like, what are you doing? You did this, what, gain, I don't know, like automatic view template detection, like and all sorts of whatever. Just there's a bunch of packages you can pull in, a handful of small packages, a nice router, a nice renderer, a few different things, and you can build a very nice web application and go.
if you really want to use a framework, you know, Rails or something similar is great. Don't get me wrong. I love Rails. I still use it for a lot of things. But I use it for these things. I use it for rapid application development, prototyping, small teams, you know, small scale projects. Um, story I like to tell, I'm giving a talk at OzCon in a couple months um, about Paper Call, which is a site I started with a friend of mine for doing CFPs for conferences. And we started building it as Go microservices. We've, now remember, we, have not ne we hadn't launched, we had zero users, we had two people working part-time at night on weekends. Um, and after six weeks of development, we had a bunch of microservices that that said hello, basically, to each other. <laughs> and so in one rage weekend, I created a new, pro new repo in GitHub called Monolith. Um, and it's the, the, the kind of description was, because I hate myself. Um, and I did it in Rails, and we got the first version up in a week. At night, part time. Because it's great for that sort of stuff. Boom, I can knock out a bunch of stuff, whatever. Um, if I'm going to do something serious, like bigger, then I'm going to move to Go. And I'm going to do that because I'm going to get that stability and that performance, right? I can get those API requests down from 300 milliseconds in Rails to one to three milliseconds and go. I know it's going to be super maintain maintained. I can, I can maintain it. Someone can just sit down and they can work on it because there's none of that magic that Ruby brings to the world. Like, you look at a Ruby app and you're like, Jesus, where the hell is that coming from? Uh, well, I guess some gem has overridden the plus operator to start doing multiplication because I can do that in Ruby, and like, Arr! Um, you know, I can work with large teams better in Go. Because again, that magic is gone, people can sit down, there's a standard formatting for Go, you know, it's pretty easy, you know what's happening, uh, and it works right out of the box for large scale. You know, Ruby does scale, but it takes a lot of effort. If you know you're gonna launch right away with three or four million people, like, you know, I was working for a project for a company in Cupertino, small startup that make phones, uh, amongst other things, um, and I call them redacted or fruit-based fruit company. Um, you know, their, the front-end project I was working on for them was going to be Go because four million developers are going to hit this thing on day one. The internal side of that was Rails, um, and we did that because there's 12 people using it internally, and boom, we turned things over really quick. The external stuff, we wanted that thing to be stable as hell um, because it was going to get hammered right away. Now this is, a, this is a definitely a slide I don't expect anybody to get. Um, pointers. No? Okay, that's the Pointer Sisters. <laughs> For those of you wondering. It took me ages. I'm like, how am I going to represent pointers? Um, so I have never worked in a language that's had pointers. I've worked in Java, and I have worked in Ruby, um, and I've never worked in a language that's actually had pointers. So when I heard pointers, I got scared. I'm thinking, oh my god, I'm going to have to do pointer arithmetic, pointer math, and all that sort of stuff. I'm like, I don't understand pointers. I don't have a computer science degree. I'm going to manage memory. Oh my god, what the hell am I going to do? You know, and it's scary. It's scary. I've never worked with pointers except for Java, which had null pointer exceptions. <laughs> okay, what's a pointer? I don't know, but you, it's null. <laughs> Th thanks for letting me know. <laughs> I'll make sure it's not null next time. Uh, I still don't understand how it works. Anyway, uh, but even experienced developers who've done these things, who've worked in something like C, which has these things, they get scared because they think, oh shit, you know, pointer arithmetic, I'm at the managed memory. So it's like, no, no, no. Pointers in Go are actually very simple and very straightforward. Um, and when I explain them to people, I kind of explain that they give you two things. It's kind of the way I say it. It's, it's very simple, simplistic view of pointers in Go. But I like to explain you get two benefits when you use pointers in Go. Um, and again, this is, don't expect you to read this. This is not even, it's not even real code, it's just comment code. Um, but the first thing I like to say is it, it offers you this kind of performance win if you use pointers. Right? So I get two functions, I got by value and by reference. When I, and I have, they, they both take some sort of type of image. Right? And the first one, okay, I've got a 50 megabyte file I've read into memory, because um, I use read all, or read file, whatever, why not? And so I read it all, I read 50 megs into memory, and I pass it to my buy value. And essentially what happens is I'm getting another 50 megs of memory up there. That's a lot of memory, right? Um, however, if I call buy reference and I just give it a pointer to it, well, instead of having all this memory, I just got a small little bit I could point to. So when you're working on your apps and, you know, you're thinking, Jesus, you know, I've got all this stuff, you know, this big data, use a pointer, right? You can very quickly pass it around, very lightly keep your performance and your memory usage down. 
The other thing I tell people is like, it also kind of gives you this night like a read write access control. It's almost like a little bit of security around your data. Um, so I've got a read only function and a read write function. If I pass in the by value, these are the same functions by the way, by value, by reference. If I give the full value to the read only one, yeah, they get that 50 megabytes of data, but no matter what they do to it, they can't screw up my original data. Right? This is great, you know, imagine like a configuration setting. You know, you want to pass that out to somebody, but expose that through your, your library's API, but you don't want people to be able to edit or change it on you. So you give them the, the value, you give them a copy of the value. They can do whatever they want to, it's not going to change the underlying value. However, maybe I want somebody to be able to watermark my image. Well, I can give them a pointer to it, now they can edit the original memory and do whatever they need to. Go is opinionated. What I find very fascinating about this particular piece of FUD is that people will say this to me without any sense of irony in the statement, I think Go's too opinionated. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> like, like you do realize that that is your opinion of the language. It's too opinionated, that's a fact. No, no, that's an opinion. Um, that's how opinions work. Opinions are, well, I'm not gonna say what opinions are like. I think everybody knows what opinions are like. <laughs> everybody has one. <laughs> and uh, this is an interesting one, because you know, when I talk about, you know, people say this to me, and they, 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 do, they do say it without any trace of irony. Um, you know, I always say, well, you know what? Rails is opinionated, Ruby's opinionated, Java's opinionated. Every language, every library, every framework is the opinions of the author. You know, when that, you know, Rob Pike et al. sat down and s started looking at Go, they set out some opinions as to how Go was going to be. When DHH sat down to start writing Rails, he said, this is how I think web development should be in Ruby. That's what we do when we design a package, when we design an API, that is our opinion of how we think you should interact. So ultimately, if you do not like the opinions of the language, then that's fine, that's your opinion, move on, go somewhere else. But don't use that to scare off other people from the language. Don't say it's too opinionated, you're gonna hate it. Well, how do you know what my opinions are? You know, try it out for yourself. Form your own opinion of it. And if you really don't like the opinions, then yeah, move on. There are things I don't like about Go, and Brad said this yesterday, there are things he doesn't like about Go. But to me, the things that I don't like far outweigh the things I do like about it. And the same thing with language like Ruby. So you form your own opinions. Lastly, by the way, I'm pretty sure this is what I was drinking last night. This just white labeled whiskey <laughs> that they kept pouring down my throat. Um, generics. Who here has heard of generics before? Hasn't come up at all in this conference, uh, nor does it ever come up. Fun fact about generics. If you say the word generics three times into a mirror, Rob Pike appears. And he's pissed. <laughs> he's very angry. Because um, you probably roused him out of a nice sleep somewhere. Um, and he's had to come to your house to talk to you about generics. I, I always, like, that was, again, like three hours of Photoshopping to cut Rob Pike out and get him there. Uh, <laughs> he's going to hate that slide. Um, <laughs> just one more time. Because, again, I spent so much time on that. Look at that. <laughs> uh, I call this like the nuclear bomb option, right? People always say, so, it doesn't have generics. You know, I can't code in a language that doesn't have generics. And I'm like, really? You're that bad a developer? You can't code in a language that doesn't have generics? Like, how terrible are you at your job? Oh my God. Uh, I, you know, I, I told you I worked in Java from 99 to about 2004 when I rage quit. And they didn't have generics then. I know they have generics now, but they didn't have generics then. And you know what I did for those five years, along with everybody else that I worked with? We shipped code. Like, we shipped code all the time. We had no generics, and we still managed to get code out the door. You know, I worked for major companies, and we shipped code using that language. And I know people who use languages all the time that don't have generics, and they ship code. If you really need generics that badly, like, you need to reevaluate what you do with your life. Um, you know, most of the time when you hear generics, you always hear the map reduce argument. I need to be able to map reduce. I can't map reduce without generics. It's so hard. 
I'm like, really? I'm like, there are a couple ways you can do generic, you know, MapReduce. I know InfluxDB, they solved it with uh, code generators. You know, it's not the prettiest of solutions, but now they've got really nice code for the types that they need to do MapReduce on, and it solved the problem. It's nice, it's performant, it works. It's not that hard. Most of the time you need generics, what are you doing? Some sort of a loop. In your app, you probably have two or three types that you really want to do that with. Just write the code, copy and paste it. It's not that hard. Create a little Vim keyboard script or Sublime script, whatever, to generate that loop for you. It's not that hard. So what? So you have the code repeated two or three times in your database. Is that really the worst thing ever? Probably not. And it's going to be a lot more performant. You know, and honestly, if you had things like generics, it does make your app a bit more unstable. It does make things like tooling much more difficult. Um, you know, and I was talking with Brad last night, and he said, you know, there were how many proposals for generics? A bunch. Thanks, Brad. <laughs> I'm glad he doesn't work for the Google Analytics team. You had a bunch of visitors yesterday. <laughs> I mean, like a whole buttload. <laughs> anyway, there are a bunch of proposals for generics, but like, you know, they, and they've all been reviewed, and some of them are like, well, here are the pros, but they all have these huge cons. Because it's not like the best solution, and for most people, you can ship a lot of great code without it. So at the end, and yes, there is an end to all this. I am coming to the end. I'm, so I'm sorry. Hate is going to hate. It is true. Haters are going to hate. And let them, you know, just move on. If you get to one of those Elmers that's a hater, just move on. When you get to the ones that have the bird on their head and they're just regurgitating that FUD, try to talk to them. Say, let me buy you a beer. Let's get our laptops out. Let's do a little coding, see what happens. And ultimately, that's all you can do when you're fighting FUD, is you can just try and educate, try and rebuff those points as best you can. Don't get angry. Don't get mean-spirited. You know, don't tell them they're wrong and they're terrible people. Just say, let's, let's get our laptops, let's get a beer, let's sit down and we'll code up some stuff and see what you think. That's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Do we have time for questions? Yeah, we have time for questions. Are there any questions? Be about anything? I could do a soft shoe. <laughs> Brian wants to see a soft shoe? Oh, question over here. Yeah, it's on. Yeah, uh, so more of a comment than a question. More uh, of a comment, okay. What I've noticed is there's a kind of tendency to be revenge for us, uh, like when you're in the Go community. Uh, I think we should stick to uh, rational arguments, like, and uh, I've seen more and more of a tendency to bash other languages because they don't have something. It's the same rule that applies in reverse, right? For example, slide when you compare Java and Go. Like, the Java code obviously does a lot more than the Go code. And, and you're saying Java, I hope, right? J-A-V-A. Right, Java, with the two Bs. Yes, go on. So, uh, the Java code obviously does a lot more than uh, the Go code does. So I just think that as a community, we should stay scientific when we're comparing mm -hmm. languages and not resort to reverse FUD ourselves. Because I started learning Java 8 and Go at the same time. In most of the cases, I really can't choose which one is better. I like both. Uh, again, just like the Go community says, OK, no generics, move on. Uh, in the same vein, you can say that, OK, data verbosity for the power of the UVM, move on. So I just think that uh, we should not fall into the same trap ourselves. Completely agree. So for those of you who couldn't hear him, and was don't go slagging off other languages. That's why I called it Java. I didn't really want to slag off another language. Um, I just use it as a bit of an example because, you know, it's, I almost use it as, a, as dummy code, just to show, try, catch, kind of finalize, and be, I also said begin, rescues, all that stuff. It is very important to not slack off other, other uh, languages because as soon as you do that, it, it makes it very easy for the other person to become a hater and be like, well, clearly this person doesn't have any respect for the thing I'm doing. Um, I respect my friend who's been coding Java for 20 years, um, you know, and I, we're very, very, very close friends, and that's what he wants to do, that's what he wants to do, it's great. Um, but I was, was very curious as to why he did it, um, and th the answer was very surprising to me. Um, but yeah, and by the way, I'm a l because I've been playing in bands for like 25 years, I am a little deaf in this ear, so please speak loudly and slowly, because <laughs> it's very difficult to hear. Other questions? Brian. So actually, it's funny. I was going to say the same thing. 
I gotta find something new to say now. But um, I, I, I always want to make sure that we don't fall into the trap of saying everyone wants to say whatever they're doing right now is the best thing because no one wants to feel like they're doing the wrong thing. So it's, it's hard to say that a half boy is wrong because they like Lambo and Daddy's Home so much. But, um, and it's hard to say that we're right because we like writing ERR colon <laughs> equals return a lot. So, um, <laughs> but I just want to make sure that we just don't fall into the trap of saying that we're awesome instead of you. We can all say that we're awesome, including you. But when we turn around and go home, we can just laugh and chuckle and know that we're <laughs> So um, <laughs> I have one more thing to say. Um, um, you, you bagged Phantom Menace, and I agree with you, but it was a bad Star Wars movie. <laughs> there are bad movies. And there's bad <laughs> movies. So I just wanted to, I did tweet at you angrily, just to let you know. <laughs> um, but thank you for your talk. It was mostly coherent, and I got a lot out of it. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> But yeah, it really is very important. And, and uh, you know, I, I, when I did that slide saying this is why I use Rails, because, you know, Rails does actually work for me in, in, in places uh, where Go doesn't or and vice versa. So it is very important to understand there's a whole world of other languages and tools and frameworks and libraries that work well for other people. And that's what I was saying. You know, we didn't have generics in Java when I was coding it, and we shipped a lot of code. So, you know. It all works out for everybody. This is why, you know, this talk was more like when people are hating on Go, here's how you can rebuff it. But don't go hating on anybody else either. So Other I questions? Or so I have a question. Yes. So it's a difficult question. So which whiskey did you have last night? Which whiskey did I have last night? God, I have no idea. It was terrible. <laughs> it was so bad. And I was told it was terrible. And they kept giving it to me. And I kept saying, I don't want this anymore. They're like, but it's terrible. And I'm like, that's why I don't want it anymore. I have no idea. Um, I can't remember what whiskey it was. I think that would have been a teacher's. That's it? I think what it is it? A teacher's. Okay. Sure. You should have I given him Old teacher. Monk. <laughs> <laughs> Stop no, no, giving me no, bad no, whiskey. That's sacrilege. <laughs> Who said that? I'm coming for you. That's an award winning rum. Great. Any other questions? I know we're behind schedule, so. No, no, we've, 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 got, uh, this, we've got time. So we've okay. got another three or four minutes worth of questions. There you go. Hi. Uh, Hi. You mentioned uh, that you rage quit when you were doing Java development. So yes. <laughs> I was curious kind of what kind of uh, development in Java in 2004, 2005 made you do that rage quit? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, tell you what I'll, I'll tell you exactly what it was. I was working on a project that had, I was a, it was a Struts 1.0 project, and uh, the project had 100,000 lines of XML configuration. Yeah. I said that. 100,000 lines between the struts and the Hibernate XML. Um, and that I had had enough. I was like, I'm, this, is, this is terrible. I had ant scripts, you know, so it was all that XML. And it was just, it was awful. And I was like, this, there's no fun in this. And this is, you know, not my passion in life. My passion is music. So I quit and worked at a recording studio, which has a whole other host of problems, let me tell you. Um, and then, like I said, Ruby kind of reinvigorated my life. Like, this is fun. Like, this is exciting. I can do cool things. And I don't need XML. I don't need 100,000 lines of XML to get anything done. So that's what it was. Ultimately, it was that one project of 100,000 lines of XML that made me quit. Other questions? Anybody else? Anybody else? No? Well, fantastic. Thank you very much for having Thank me. I really much. appreciate it.